the story of the American involvement in the nuclear effort as part of the Second World War is a long one, and, I, and there's going to be no chance to deal with more than a, a, a few elements in it. Uh, when I first got to Los Alamos, I learned that uh, the uh, chain reaction already existed, and that was quite a surprise. But the effort was to be somehow to turn turn it into an, an explosion. Now, uh, a chain reaction in a reactor is something that is very controlled and goes on very slowly. There are some aspects of the fission process. They're rather rare and infrequent, but they take place only over a time interval. Uh, the emission of what are called delayed neutrons. Uh, that means a, a reactor uh, can exist and its, its intensity can vary over a period of, of seconds or minutes uh, because of the delays uh, involved. And the effect of that is to make reactors very easy to control. Uh, you don't uh, have the problem that the reactor is going to uh, explode in, in the length of time that it takes, let's say, a neutron to travel just from one nucleus to a neighboring nucleus. That time is awfully short, something like uh, 10 to the minus 10th seconds or so, uh, one uh, 10 billionth of a second or even shorter. Uh, it's when you have big things happening over intervals of time like that that you have an explosion. And uh, uh, when the whole effort is to slow neutrons down, uh, as it is in a reactor, uh, to slow them down because slow neutrons are much more effective in inducing fission uh, than fast neutrons, uh, <coughs> That very slowing down, uh, along with various other factors, makes uh, a reactor relatively easy to control and handle. And the whole idea of a nuclear explosion is to get rid of all of these moderating materials that slow neutrons down, uh, to take advantage of the very swift passage of neutrons from one nucleus to another, uh, and it is that that is the explosion. But there's a bit of a problem. Have a, a reactive mass, that means it's more than a certain critical size. It means that the neutrons are most likely to start chain reactions before sufficient escape has taken place of the neutrons. And uh, in a situation like that, uh, with no moderation, no slowing down of the neutrons, uh, it all develops very quickly. Well, now you have the question, how do you ever get to one of these situations in which the mass is above the critical mass and in which uh, there is a low enough probability that the neutrons uh, escape without inducing fission? so that a great deal of fission takes place. Well, you see there's a kind of contradiction in that. What you would have to do is put the masses of uh, fissionable material together into a supercritical configuration so quickly that it would happen before any explosion could take place. Otherwise, if you do it at all slowly, you get a condition called pre-detonation, uh, in which uh, the uh, explosion begins before any serious explosion can, can take place, just because of the configuration of, of the matter. Well, uh, <clears throat> the first idea was to shoot uh, a cylinder of fissionable material into a hollow sphere, a sphere with a big hole in it, using a gun. 
And indeed, if you uh, do that with a gun, uh, it may take all of a thousandth of a second to put the system together. And if no fissions are going to happen within that thousandth of a second, and they only start later, then you'll get an explosion all right. That was the first plan for doing this. It was the so-called gun assembly, and it's what people were thinking about before even the Los Alamos project was put together. There were a few surprises that made that uh, somewhat less practical. But one of the first problems in putting the Los Alamos project together was assembling a collection of rather temperamental physicists who didn't want to be quite so restricted. Uh, the uh, military authorities who were trying to assemble the project felt that no person should have any knowledge of what was going on aside from his particular task in the research. His restricted activity, and he was not to know what anybody else was doing. The scientists who were being called in to take part in this tried to tell the military people that that would never work, that you needed ideas, that there were ideas, uh, there were many unsolved problems, they needed a maximal number of suggestions for how to solve them, and that was never going to happen if everybody was restricted to knowing only about his particular task. So many, many of the scientists threatened to leave in 1943 uh, until the general uh, who was directing the project realized that the only way of doing this was to keep civilian control, and the man he had chosen for this was a remarkable choice, Robert Oppenheimer. And it was Oppenheimer who expressed the opinion of the scientists and, and the general, Groves, had only to agree with that. That held the project together, uh, apart from the few who left in the very earliest days. Uh, and uh, I didn't get there until the project was well underway in the beginning of 1945. Uh, no, 1944, I'm sorry. At that stage, there was one of the experimenters, a former collaborator with Fermi, uh, who was making measurements uh, of what is called spontaneous fission. Spontaneous fission is fission that just happens without being induced by a neutron that comes in. Uh, it produces neutrons and it would start a chain reaction if you have any spontaneous uh, fission going on. There wasn't very much spontaneous fission in uranium-235, and for that reason, uh, it was possible to use the gun assembly. And that gun assembly was, in fact, mechanically already being shipped to Tinian Island when the test of the bomb was made, the so-called Trinity test, in uh, 1945. Uh, in August of 1945. The gun assembly was planned, uh, but it would have been a, the, the production of the uranium-235, which was necessary for that, was rather slow. In the meantime, several years before, the production of a new element, plutonium, a transuranic element, uh, was discovered, and uh, it could be produced in reactors. It was being produced, and much more rapidly than uranium-235 was being produced. The problem was, as uh, discovered in 1944, that plutonium has a considerable spontaneous fission rate. That meant that if you used anything as slow as a thousandth of a second <laughs> to put the system together, it would pre-detonate and you'd never get an explosion. 
it was necessary to use high explosives to put the plutonium bomb together, and that became a total preoccupation. What was necessary was a way of directing an explosion inward. Uh, it was called an implosion, and uh, that was developed all during 1944 and 1945, that particular technique, and it kept failing and it kept producing really awful results. And it wasn't even clear what kinds of results it would produce when finally it was tested uh, at the Trinity site in southern New Mexico in August, I think it was August 15th or 16th, of uh, 1945. To everybody's surprise, it worked rather better than any of the predictions. There was a pool held, a betting pool, in Oppenheimer's office, and uh, the guesses were concentrated uh, down around 1,000 tons of TNT equivalent, or even lower, some went some guesses went all the way down to zero. And the, uh, the man who won the pool, in fact, uh, explained his strategy. He looked in the notebook that had all the guesses and found the largest interval between <laughs> two other people's guesses. <laughs> so there was much more uncertainty than the world has recognized since then. Uh, but uh, we really had no certainty at all that it would work. I watched from a mountaintop near Albuquerque because as a theorist, uh, I worked on neutron diffusion problems during the war years. Uh, but as a result of that, they didn't want the likes of me near this rather secret test. So uh, some of us who, who could manage to uh, get hold of a car drove to the top of Sandia Peak near Albuquerque and watched from a distance of 100 miles. And it was quite a spectacular show, even from there. It's interesting to <laughs> think what were the applications of nuclear weapons uh, once the explosion had taken place, once the secret was out, which happened very quickly, there were still a number of secrets retained, various surprises that we had had along the way, which were left as possible surprises to any other country that wanted to undertake this. There uh, uh, were questions raised, uh, we were all asked for suggestions what might be the peaceful uses of nuclear weapons. Uh, very few suggestions emerged and none was ever acted upon. To my knowledge, there has been no practical application of nuclear explosions other than as a weapon. There have been, they've I'm sure have been developed in many uh, different weapon-like applications uh, as artillery or what have you, but none of the suggestions that anybody made had any value at all for peacetime purposes. Now on the other hand, you had an individual like Edward Teller. Uh, Teller uh, was a very temperamental man. He was even absent from the project, uh, having gone off in an angry fit. When I went there, uh, he came back with the agreement that he would work on nothing but the hydrogen bomb. He thought the nuclear weapon was a foregone conclusion. And uh, indeed, he was given a small division, all his own, to try to do the calculations that would justify the, uh, the hydrogen bomb, which would be a different sort of thing, a, new, a thermonuclear reaction. But the idea was to use the atomic bomb as a kind of match to light the thermonuclear fire. And 
uh, he had no solution to that problem and had none for years. Uh, eventually, the uh, problem was solved, at least in large part, by a pure mathematician he had employed and decided during the war years had no value at all because his mathematics was altogether too pure. Uh, it was that chap, Stanislaus Ulam, uh, who uh, uh, worked out uh, the solution to the problem of how you ignite the hydrogen bomb, but that was only in the 1950s, a good deal later. I think the world knows what has emerged from all of this, uh, all of the threats and fears, many of which go on, uh, these are weapons, particularly the hydrogen bomb, which make almost no sense at all. They are far too vast uh, and uh, uh, are not weapons in any reasonable sense. The whole business has gone rather far and produced remarkably little in practical terms or in useful terms. But I must say, many of the people who were at Los Alamos during the war years have emerged as among the most distinguished scientists in America. Uh, it was very hard recruiting those people because most of America's scientifically trained people were already at work by 1943 on war projects. Uh, they only came after somebody 18 years old like me because they were at their wit's end. The development of these weapons has remained questionable to many people in the years after the war because they are more of a threat than uh, a reassurance uh, in, in these years. Uh, I would have to say that the weapon was intended, if possible, to put an end to the European war. There was literally no prior thought about using the weapon uh, in Japan, reg or regarding Japan as a nuclear threat at all. The problem was that Germany, in principle, knew and was capable, knew exactly what we knew. They had, in fact, known it just a little before. Uh, they were, to be realistic, we now see, not capable of producing uh, any effort on that scale uh, during the war years, but we had very little evidence of what they were doing and really felt we had no alternative. It remains a serious question whether it ever was a good idea to develop such weapons. Uh, would they have been developed had we not done it? That's an interesting question and history will have to decide.